We have looked at the UFO phenomenon from a testimonial perspective, a technological perspective, and a theological perspective. Now let's examine UFOs and aliens by listening to the message of these alleged aliens and see if we can identify if these are the aliens we're looking for. This is part four of the Genesis Week special report miniseries. Thank you for joining me again. I'm your host, Ian Juby. We looked at the impossibility of intelligent alien life on other planets from a scientific perspective, verified by the complete and utter lack of any evidence of intelligent alien life. The biblical record of creation, which makes zero mention of life on other planets, and in fact indicates that the stars and planets were created for Earth's inhabitants, not to be inhabited by other life. So now let's move on to what secular scientists and researchers are saying about the possibility of aliens visiting Earth. However, in order to get there, we need to discuss some adult-related themes not suitable for younger viewers, and some more sensitive viewers will find this understandably disturbing. So, this is your warning, viewer discretion is advised. Famous scientist Carl Sagan, who is definitely no friend of creationists nor Christians, oddly entitled his 1996 book, The Demon Haunted World, Science is a Candle in the Dark. He addressed the possibility that UFOs are extraterrestrial visitations. A 1969 study by the National Academy of Sciences, while recognizing that there are reports not easily explained, concluded that the least likely explanation of UFOs is the hypothesis of extraterrestrial visitations by intelligent beings. Think of how many other explanations there might be. Time travelers, demons from witchland, tourists from another dimension, the souls of the dead, or non-Cartesian phenomena that doesn't obey the rules of science or even logic. Each of these explanations has in fact been seriously proffered. Least likely is really saying something. So these naturalist scientists are literally saying that UFOs are alien visitors is the least likely possibility. It is far more likely that these are time travelers visiting us in these UFOs. Now, one of the many, many reasons these naturalists say this is because of the testimonies of witnesses who have had encounters with alleged aliens associated with UFOs. Now, Sagan was a huge supporter of the SETI research, so it's not like he wasn't hoping UFOs might be extraterrestrials, but you remember the astonishing statistics I brought up in part one of this miniseries. How one in 40 people on average have had encounters with aliens. These naturalist researchers, of course, did something very smart. After all, if you've got so many people having encounters, and even repeated visits and conversations with ETs that you've spent your life searching for? Well, doesn't it make sense to go and talk to these contactees? Well, of course it does. The 1995 book, The Gods Have Landed, New Religions from Other Worlds, was edited by James R. Lewis, and to the best of my knowledge, none of the contributors were very religious. They each approach the topic of contactees in a very methodical, scientific way. The very first chapter, The Contactees, a survey, was con a study conducted by the author J. Gordon Melton. He simply surveyed a bunch of contactees, that is, people who believe they have made contact with ETs. His conclusions are remarkable and probably shocking to most people, as this contactee phenomenon is not at all what people think it is. Melton wrote in his conclusion, this survey of the contactee movement has verified a conclusion reached earlier that the flying saucer movement is in effect a new branch of occult religion. It follows the patterns of occult religious bodies and draws most of its content from general occult teachings. 
The contactees also hold little promise of supplying any useful information on the nature of the physical universe or outer space. They seek as a group religious, not scientific goals, though they live in an age that demands some lip service to science and some technological sophistication, even in religious matters. Wow! Occult religion? Why on earth would he say such a thing? If someone said to you that they had a visit with an alien, well, how would you picture that in your event in your mind? Most likely you would picture some spaceship coming down and landing in front of this person, and alien greys coming out and talk to them for a while, right? Where is the occult religion in that? Well, first of all, 99.999% of the time, the picture of events I just described to you is not at all what happens. Active and continuing contact with the alleged aliens is typically accomplished by mediums via seances, channeling, and Ouija boards. There's the occult religion Melton and so many other secular researchers talk about. Still others are subjected to the alien abduction phenomenon, which almost always happens at night when the person is sleeping. This abduction event is typically psychological and physical torture and rape. It is usually ongoing, that is, the aliens come back over and over again for years and persistently torture these people. And what has been found is that all of these people have had ties to the occult. Either they, they themselves were involved in the occult, or their parents were, or someone they were living with was involved in the occult. I have yet to see an exception. Many alleged contact incidents are only recalled through hypnosis. So now take a really sketchy procedure that has very unreliable results already, use it to bring forward memories of events which may or may not have happened. Well, there's certainly no physical evidence that these alien encounters happened. Now, you might not know Jacques Vallée, but he was the inspiration for the lead scientist in the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind. He was a strictly, strictly secular researcher when it comes to UFOs and aliens. Note well his observations about the UFO and in alien interactions with people. The reported interaction with the occupants of the UFOs is absurd, and their overtly scientific experiments are crude to the point of being grotesque. The medical examination to which abductees are said to be subjected, often accompanied by sadistic sexual manipulation, is reminiscent of the medieval tales of encounters with demons. It makes no sense in a sophisticated or technical or biological framework. Any intelligent being equipped with the scientific marvels that UFOs possess would be in a position to achieve any of these alleged scientific objectives in a shorter time with fewer risks. The contactee reports continue to come from reliable, well-balanced observers, and they increasingly point to the existence of a genuine technology pursuing its own hidden agenda. Hidden agenda? Dr. Vallée mentions this crucial topic in passing. The hidden agenda of these alleged aliens becomes apparent when you focus on the message they bring, and simultaneously gives us a clear indication of just who these beings are. The message of the alleged aliens is fairly consistent in its goals, though the message has changed throughout the centuries to match the popular science of the day. Vallée actually called these aliens messengers of deception. A believer in UFOs, Vallée documents his conclusions about the aliens based on exhaustive research in incredible detail and logic in his 1997 book by that title. Barely into the book, he summarizes where he's going with all this. Whatever they are, the occupants are not genuine extraterrestrials. This leaves us with few alternatives. Either they are images created within the brains of the witnesses, possibly by remote stimulation of the visual cortex, or they are characters in a staged occurrence, actors in a deception operation, carefully borrowing its concepts from basic human archetypes, 
in order to force a global behavioral change. Global behavioral change? The message the aliens have brought through the centuries to literally millions of people have a lot of commonalities. They love to talk about the end times, the end of the world, book of revelation type stuff. They then turn around and claim that they are humanity's salvation from the end time disasters that are coming. They claim to want to help us uh, help ourselves and bring world peace. Oh, isn't that a wonderful message? They want to help us accomplish this goal by establishing a one-world government. Those of you who have read the Bible knows that the book of Revelation talks about a one-world government in the last days, headed up by the Antichrist. Kind of unusual that E.T. would be so interested in bringing that one-world government about. Hmm. E.T. wants you to explore the occult. E.T. repeatedly talks about how religions must be moved, removed, sorry, <laughs> but especially the Christian religion. They slander Christ. They are notorious liars. They attack and misquote the Bible. E.T. likes to quote the Bible a lot, but it's always out of context, always in line with being messengers of deception. These are all exceedingly odd things for E.T. to be so focused on, but it does line up perfectly with demonic, occultic religion. So what are demons exactly? Now, the Bible does talk extensively about intelligent beings not of this world. They're called angels. And it's very enlightening to read the Bible to better understand their capabilities. They are basically interdimensional beings like God. Uh, time itself is a dimension of creation, so the ability to operate outside of time would make you an interdimensional being, if you can picture that. So angels can manifest themselves in this world, this dimension, or in the parallel dimension we call heaven. When they do manifest themselves, they are almost always mistaken for people. It is a common misconception that angels have wings. Generally speaking, they do not. This misconception is reinforced by so much historic artwork which depicts them with wings, unfortunately. In the book of Judges, Gideon has an entire conversation with an angel, goes home and makes a meal for him, comes back, and the angel touches the meal with his staff and burns up the meal and then disappears. It's only then that Gideon realizes this was an angel. But look at this. The angel appeared as a man. He wasn't naked, so obviously he manifested clothes as well. He also had a staff, a solid object. He was able to manifest fire. These are the abilities of the angels. In Genesis 19, two angels are sent to Lot in the city of Sodom, and again Lot and the entire city mistakes them for men. Lot even feeds them a meal and they eat. In the book of Acts, the Apostle Peter is chained in prison, and an angel shows up in prison. He just walked through solid walls. He smacks Peter upside the head, and Peter's chains fall off from his hands. The angel then escorts him out of the prison, opening metal doors without even touching them. So the angels can interact with this material dimension, our world. In the book of Numbers, Balaam is confronted by the angel of the Lord, who manifests not only himself, but a sword. And he plainly said he was going to use that sword to kill Balaam. In 1 Chronicles, an angel is sent with a sword to destroy the city of Jerusalem, and does so. So angels are able to manifest metal objects that can interact with us humans in this dimension, and even harm us with the manifested objects. In multiple places in the Bible, it talks about the angels manifesting both horses and chariots of fire. Now, at some point shortly after creation, an angel called Lucifer, who was most beautiful and charged with music in heaven, decided he wanted to take God's throne. In his insanity, he convinced one-third of the angels in heaven to join him in trying to overthrow God. Now, of course, they failed. As a robotics engineer, if my robotic creations decided they would try to overthrow me, hey, I created them. I know their weaknesses, and I know where their on-off switch is. <laughs> so Lucifer and the rebellious angels were cast out of heaven. 
where did they go? Well, Jesus tells us, mentioning Lucifer's new name, Satan. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Satan and his fallen angels are right here on earth with a vendetta against God. Now, they can't hurt God directly, so they seek to hurt God by hurting you, the object of his love. Notice what Jesus said about Judgment Day. Then shall he also say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was never intended for people. It was punishment for Satan and his rebellious angels. But there's only two kingdoms here, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of hell. If you reject the kingdom of heaven, there's only one other kingdom to inherit. The kingdom of Satan, which was specifically designed as punishment for Satan. It's not some kingdom of fun and games where he rules over everybody there. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, the famous I will story of the great fall of Satan, it describes what will happen to Satan in the future. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? Here is this pathetic being in his kingdom, his punishment. So you have a choice of which kingdom you wish to inherit and the price you will pay accordingly. Now, today's topic makes the Apostle Paul's comments to the Galatians especially intriguing. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any gospel unto you other than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. I want you to meet Joseph Jordan. Now, I like Joe. He's a very down-to-earth guy, even when talking about out-of-this-world stuff. Now, way back in 1991, he was on a flight and got a book called UFO Crash at Roswell. He read the book and was immediately hooked on UFOs. Now, you got to understand, at that time, Joe was into the New Age religion. He was not a Christian. He became involved with MUFON, starting out as a field investigator and eventually becoming a state section director. Now, being a field investigator, he would go interview UFO observers, take the field notes, and research the sightings. Of course, because the alien abduction phenomenon was always associated with UFOs, he would invariably wind up with people claiming they were abducted and were seeking help. Joe would faithfully document their incident. Then one day he met a man by the name of Bill Deffendahl. Now, Bill was a typical alien abduction survivor, and he shared a story of one of the many attacks, the Aliens had already come, been coming for a long time now, and the attack started again one night while he was sleeping. In his words, the alien showed up and put a pole up his anus and suspended him in the air on this pole. Now, Bill had only recently become a born-again Christian. You could never stop these aliens and attacks. It left you completely helpless. Bill was desperate, as always, but now something had changed. He had had a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. So, out of desperation, he called out to Jesus, Jesus, help me. The aliens made a sound like they were hurt, dropped him on the bed, and never returned. Old New Ager Joe here was completely taken aback this by this. What, what do you mean they stopped? They never stopped. Joe started asking around with other researchers who all privately admitted what nobody wanted to publicly acknowledge, that they had encountered this before as well. Joe wound up having his own personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ and became a Christian through all of this. Meet Guy Malone. He's a really cool guy who was your typical alien abduction survivor until one day he too became a Christian and discovered the real identity of these aliens, and that through the name and power of Jesus Christ, he was able to end the alien abduction phenomenon. Now, the name of Jesus wasn't some 
magic wand, but rather it was the abductee's allegiance and personal relationship with Christ that ended the alien abductions. Guy asks a profound question of the rhetorical kind. If they were aliens with superior technology, do you think the name of Christ would stop them? The name of Muhammad doesn't stop the abductions. The name of Buddha doesn't stop them. Medications and psychological therapy doesn't stop the abductions. In fact, it's sad to say that for most churches, if someone came to them looking for help because they were being abducted, raped, and tortured by aliens, the churches would probably point them to psychiatrists who are of no help. While the church is the only one that has the answer to the problem. Guy and Joe started the CE4 research group. CE4 is a reference to close encounters of the fourth kind, or alien abduction. Guy moved to the thriving metropolis of Roswell, New Mexico, made famous by the Roswell UFO crash of the 1940s. Guy set up a ministry to alien abductees right across from the UFO museum in Roswell to show these people how they can terminate the rape and torture events by establishing a relationship with the creator of the universe, Jesus Christ. The CE4 research group has compiled the testimonies of hundreds of abductees who have been set free from the reported torments of the alien abduction phenomenon. You can read and sometimes hear the audio testimonies of well over 100 people who were willing to share their testimony on the CE4 research website, alienresistance.org. Joe Jordan and Jason December also just recently released an excellent book, Piercing the Cosmic Fail, which was the contributions of various authors, including yours truly. The cover, they cover the topic quite exhaustively and include multiple testimonies of alien abduction survivors, all revealing the true nature of the alien abduction phenomenon. I want to close out this series by visiting the website of some very famous contactees, the Heaven's Gate cult. Now, the website is still maintained to this day by an unknown individual, as the cult members all committed mass suicide in March of 1997. As we wade through their writings, bring to your remembrance everything we have learned in the four parts of this mini-series, as they exemplify the UFO alien phenomenon and its dangers. Please note, these people are dead because of their beliefs. They were a religious cult started by Bonnie Nettles and Marshall Applewhite, who believed that not only were they in contact with an ET, well, let's just read the statement by an ET presently incarnate. Their words, not mine. In the early 1970s, two individuals, my task partner and myself, from the evolutionary level above human, the kingdom of heaven, incarnated into, moved into, and took over two human bodies that were in their 40s. I moved into a male body, and my partner, who is an older member in the level above human, took a female body. These two alleged ETs called themselves T and Doe, and as you can see here in their channeled writings, channeling is an occultic practice, through the bodies they possessed the bodies of Nettles and Applewhite, <laughs> they admit it right there, ET doesn't possess people, but demons do, and that is exactly the description of demon possession. Notice how they tie evolution together with their claim to be ETs and that the kingdom of heaven is the next step in human evolution. Of course, to get to the kingdom of heaven, the evolutionary level above human, you have to die. Which they did in time with the visit of Comet Hale Bop as the ETs told them that their spaceship was hiding in the tail of the comet. Notice how ET repeatedly quotes the Bible including multiple quotes from Jesus talking about dying. But 
Then E.T. claims that Satan and one-third of the angels that fell with him are previous humans who rejected the next level of evolution and are now Luciferians, deceiving people, and that Christians are deceived into believing Jesus was God incarnate. They cherry-pick quotes from the Bible, especially things that Jesus said about dying on this earth to enter into heaven. But then, just like the Raelians, they ignore the majority of things Jesus said, including the crucial statements like, I am. They also ridicule Christians and the writers of the Gospels as being deceived by the Luciferians. The non-sequiturs and self-contradictions are glaring. Lastly, by way of introductions, they provide an image of themselves, a perfect portrait of the alien greys, exactly in line with the descriptions of the imposters posing as aliens to millions of other people. You know, the alien imposters who are subject to the name of Jesus Christ. The Jesus Christ who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. The one who created the stars for us here on Earth and not to be E.T.'s home. E.T. doesn't exist. But Jesus sure did. His coming to Earth was monumental and Earth-shaking. He also said he is returning to make a new heaven and a new Earth because this one was corrupted by the fall of mankind. Where will you stand when he returns? Thank you for joining me. I hope you found this mini-series informative, challenging, and enjoyable. Make sure you catch the Complete Creation series, which was the prequel to this unplanned mini-series. <laughs> I'm Ian GB signing off for now. God bless you. You can catch the entire series in a variety of ways. You can watch the show online at www.completecreation.org or www.genesisweek.com. You can also purchase the Complete Creation series in full high definition on Blu-ray or video on demand at completecreation.org. Or support the Miracle Channel with a monthly tax-deductible donation and access the entire Complete Creation series in high definition through Corco, Miracle Channel's video on demand service. We need your support to keep this program on the air. So please pray for us, and if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, K2K2P4. Or you can make a donation via PayPal online at ianjuby.org forward slash donations. And thank you for your support. Thank you.